Leviticus chapter 23. We are slipping back into the Old Testament this morning, taking a one-week break from our study through the book of Romans. Church, I don't know about you, but I am thoroughly enjoying the opportunity we have to go verse by verse, word by word, through the book of Romans, understanding what God has been speaking through that into our lives. Church, it's been powerful. It's been exciting for me. I hope it's been exciting for you as well. But this morning, we're going to take a one-week break. We are going to look back into the Old Testament to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, Reason being, church, as we look at our calendars, who knows what today is? October 2nd, 2016, Sunday morning, time of worship, I understand. But other than Mr. Lloyd, I know Mr. Lloyd knows. He's going crazy in the back. I know he's excited for today. When you're looking at October 2nd on your calendar, what does that represent on the Jewish calendar? Rosh Hashanah. Today as sundown begins what we know according to the Jewish calendar, Rosh Hashanah. And I'm going to be honest with you. I remember as a child growing up, and I remember looking on the calendar. As a child in school, you were looking for the days that we got off of school. So I remember looking through the calendar all the time, and I would see these different Jewish events labeled on the calendar, and I would literally brush right past them because I did not understand them. I didn't understand what they represented, what they meant. They meant nothing to me. But thank God for grace. Amen? That as I've grown, as I've matured, hopefully as you have as well, we're beginning to understand and realize there is significance behind each one of these days on the Jewish calendar. So this morning, I want us to look at Rosh Hashanah. Understanding this, Rosh Hashanah is like January 1 for us here in the United States. It is the beginning of the Jewish New Year. It's much like Easter for us. Have you ever noticed on Easter Sunday, when you come into church, it's packed from side to side, from front to back. You get all the CEOs, the ones that come on Christmas, Easter, and other special occasions, and that's it. They'll pack out. They'll come. Well, that's a lot what it's like on Rosh Hashanah in the Jewish community. On Rosh Hashanah, everybody comes in on this day to celebrate. People that have never really come before are going to be here on this day. The Jewish elders and leaders will actually demand that their children be there on this day for a time of celebration. Their children may have nothing to do with the faith anymore, but their, their parents are willing to do whatever it takes. There's actually a joke, a joke that's even told. I'd like to read it this morning. A Jewish parent called his son in New York. The father said to him, I hate to tell you, but your mother and I cannot stand each other anymore. We're divorcing. It's final. There's nothing to talk about. It's simply over. I want to live out the rest of my years in peace. I'm telling you now so that you and your sister won't go into shock later on when I actually move out. The father then abruptly hung up the phone. The son immediately called his sister and told her the news, to which she responded, I'll handle this. She immediately called her father and said, don't do anything till David and I get there. We'll be there by Friday night. The father said, fine, I'll wait till you get here on Friday night. He then hangs up the phone, turns with a grin on his face and yells to his wife, Honey, I got them. They'll be here for Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> truth is, his parents will do whatever it takes, won't we? We know that's truth. But all joking aside, I want to remind us, this is to be a time of celebration. This is a big deal for Jewish leaders. And the question I want to ask this morning is, why? Why is this day such a big day? Why is this day set aside as such a time of celebration for the Jews? One reason, church, because this day is important to God. This is a day that God himself set aside, a time that he asked to be a time of remembrance. This is actually to be a memorial, a time to remember all that God has done for his chosen people, the Jews, the people of Israel. So let's go ahead and read Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to read verses 23 through 27 to listen to this exact command that God gives to his people. Listen to what he says. Leviticus 23, I'll pick up in verse 23. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, in church, that is today, just so you understand, that is today, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now look at verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses again, saying, Also, the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. 
You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Two days that is set aside, we'll look at this morning. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, God, I ask for wisdom. I ask for understanding. I ask for a spirit of discernment. God, in my life and the life of your people, as we look into your word to understand why this day is a day that you set aside. Yes, for your people Israel, but God, how it applies to us today, 2016. The call that you are just as well placing inside of our lives. God, open our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, the question is, what is the significance of Rosh Hashanah? What is the significance of this day that we also call the Feast of Trumpets? And how does it tie into that second memorial there in verse 27, that day of atonement? Whereas Rosh Hashanah signifies a time of God calling his people together for spiritual awakening, the day of atonement signifies a time of repentance. Why? For a quickly coming time of judgment. A time where he's calling for his people to come in repentance because he is coming soon. So for the next couple of moments today, I want to take just a little bit of an opportunity to further explain the meaning of Rosh Hashanah and to truly understand how it applies to us here today. So if you're taking notes, number one, I want to give the different names used to label this event. And there's a purpose and a reason for this. So write these down because it'll come back and tie in in just a moment. The different names used to label this festival. There are actually five alternative names given. They are this. Number one, I'll put it on the screen. Yom Tirah. Yom Tirah, which is a biblical name, meaning the day of the blowing of trumpets. Yom Tirah. This is a modern day Judaism teaching that this name was given because this day is set aside to call the Jews back to remember their sins. This is a time for God's people to stop and look back in their life, to evaluate, to look back on, to recognize the sinfulness of their lives before Almighty God. So number one is Yom Tirah, the day of blowing of trumpets that signifies in that trumpet blow to say, look back in your life. Look back and realize the sinfulness. Number two, the second name is the Memorial of Triumph. The Memorial of of triumph. And this is based on Job chapter 38, verse 7, where it states that the sons of God or the angels of God actually shouted for joy as God himself spoke life into creation. He spoke creation into being. So all of his angels, all of these that he has created, cry out in triumph at this time as God created all that we know today. So it was a time of celebration. As that horn blew, they are realizing the power of Almighty God as he spoke life into being. All that we know today. So it was a memorial of triumph. Number three. The third name is the Day of Remembrance. The Day of Remembrance. Again, this calls for a time for the Jews to remember their sins, but for a purpose. That they might come to a time of repentance for nine days later on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is a time to remember the sins, to reflect upon the sins, to prepare oneself on how they're going to come before God in recognition of their unholiness before a holy God. So the Day of Remembrance. The fourth, this is important now, the fourth is the Day of Judgment. It's also known as the Day of Judgment. This name deriving from a traditional Jewish teaching that on this day, all Jews undergo a self-judgment, a self-evaluation to determine the depth of their sin, to recognize just how much they need salvation. Are you listening on that one? We could do a little of this today. This is a time for all the Jews on this day to go and undergo a self-examination, a self-judgment to determine the depth of their sins, to recognize just how far off they are, just how far away they become inside of their sinfulness and how much they need Almighty God. And then the fifth and the final, the most common name that we know on our calendars today is Rosh Hashanah, which simply means the head of the year or the first of the year. So Rosh Hashanah begins the beginning of the new Jewish year, the day which all creation itself began that God came forward. So we have five different biblical names. Keep those in mind. Number two, 
I want us to look at the purpose of this Jewish holiday. <laughs> the purpose behind this Jewish holiday. I want you to stick with me because there's a lot of application that comes back to us right here in 2016, including inside this room. So think about this. The purpose of the Jewish holiday. Looking back at Leviticus 23, it clearly states that this is to be a memorial day. We have Memorial Day right here in the United States. What do we memorialize here in the United States? What do we come back to remember on that day of Memorial Day here in the United States? To remember all those who've gone on before us, who paid the price for our freedom, that we could be here to worship today, amen? That time that's something we'll never want to forget here in America, knowing so many, church, laid down their lives that you and I could be here freely today to worship the one true God. There is not a freedom like that across the world today. We have a gift. So we come to that day and we say, let us not forget. And that's exactly what God's saying here in Leviticus 23. I'm going to pick up verse 24. He said, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a what? A memorial, a day to remember, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So church, on Rosh Hashanah, they were to blow a shafar. And I put a picture up on the screen for you. Miss Judy, if you remember, when you retired here to church, I remember that we actually gave you one of these. We bought this as a parting gift for you. Do you understand the, the purpose of that gift that we gave you? The shofar is a ram's horn for the people of Israel. And this is a, a horn, a signifier that they use to shout. They blow it, and it calls all people to attention. It gathers their attention and says, whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing, focus, listen here, because there's a reason. There's a purpose behind it. So on Rosh Hashanah, the shofar, that ram's horn, is blown inside the synagogue. And I want to show with you the two reasons. The two reasons why they blow this horn, this shofar, so to speak. Number one, it's blown for a call to remembrance and repentance. The first reason is it's blown for a call to remembrance and repentance. Again, this is a time for the Jews to remember their sins, all that they've done in disobedience to God's call for holiness. Why? So that they can come to that time of repentance inside their lives, that time again of self-evaluation. They look back in and they realize who they really are. You know, we have a real problem with this in America today. When I stop and look at America, we've become so busy. Do you realize we are a 24-7 society? You know what they call New York City? The city that never? We are so busy. We've gotten so, so full in our calendars and our schedules. We're going here, we're going there, we're doing this, and we're going that, and all of life wraps around us. We're so busy in ourselves and the things we do. The reason that so far that horn is blown, for the people of Israel to stop and remember, to stop what they're doing inside their lives and to look back inward and realize their walk before Almighty God. Does not America need to do that today? A time for us to stop in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of all that we're doing, to remember that call that God's placing even now. To say, look back inside your lives. Do that self-evaluation. Look back inside your own heart and realize just how far off we've become. Church, when we stop and look in America today, think about the abortion rate that we live amongst. It's breaking my heart as we're listening to these presidential candidates talk about lives matter, and we are killing babies in the millions. If life matters, church, what's wrong with us? When are the people of God gonna stand up? When are we gonna stop being silent and sitting in our pews and going to step out and say, no more. This is a life that does matter. This is a life that God created. Look at the murder rate inside the United States today. Look at the greed of the people. We have more and more that we're wanting in our lives. As we're walking through our, our Wednesday night Bible study, we've actually been discussing this. Did you know that the average person today dies at the age of 85, over $100,000 in debt on the credit card? Why? Why do we have credit card? Because if you don't have the money, go get it anyhow, because you deserve it. Because your neighbor has it, you want it, go get it. The shofar is blown, why? So the people of God, Christians, those who have made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, we stop, move off of life, and reflect back on the inside to realize our walk before Almighty God, the sinfulness that we have. So this is not only a call for America today, you know what it's a call for? It's a call for the church. It's a call for the people of God to stop and look back inside, yes, inside the four walls of the building, but inside of our own hearts. To realize if it doesn't start in me, where does it start? Church, it's a time for remembrance 
in a time of repentance as we call out for our selfishness, our rebelliousness, our blatant disobedience before Almighty God. Do you know what the number one command in the Bible is? You shall love the Lord your God with some of your heart. All? Really? Are we? Because I thought I spoke it just as we do it. I love the Lord my God with some of my heart, with some of my mind, and some of my soul. But there's still some of me in the way. But the command is love the Lord your God with all your heart. That so far, that horn is blown for a time of remembrance for the people of God, God's chosen people of Israel, God's chosen people inside this room, if you're here today, to remember, to look back at our lives, to remember he has called us to love God with all that we are, with all of our strength. And we know we fall short today. This is a time to remember and a time that we come back into repentance inside of our lives for Israel and for us today. The second reason the shofar is blown is a time to remember, listen to this, Israel's covenant relationship with God. I love this point. Now stick with me. It was a time for Israel to remember their covenant relationship with Almighty God. As that shofar, that horn was blasted out, it was a time for them to remember that covenant that God made in Exodus chapter 19 and Exodus chapter 20 and that time between him and Israel. And I want to remind you, if you go back and read, it was for nothing Israel had done. Israel was not a special people. Israel didn't just kind of stand out. It was because of God's choosing inside their lives. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'll put it on the screen for you. Deuteronomy 7, I'm going to pick up verse 6. This is talking of God speaking to Israel. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Look at verse 7. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you are more in number than any other people. For you are the least of all. Look at verse 8. But because the Lord loves you. Why did God choose Israel? Because of his grace, because of his mercy, because of his love. He set them apart and he redeemed them. And he, he said, set this time aside when that horn is blown, when that trumpet blows, remember this relationship. It was for nothing you have done, but everything that I did inside your life. Church, I want to stop and bring application back to 2016. I want to ask you, who in this, I'm going to use a very church word, so please forgive me. This is a very churchy word. Who in this room this morning is saved? I want you to raise your hand. You're saved. You've professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've repented of your sins. You've made Jesus Christ Lord of your life. All of you raising your hands, I'm going to ask you this question. Why did God save you? What made you so special? Why did God forgive you your sins? If we were to time and do a time of reflection this morning, like we're being called to, and you understood who you truly are, the things you've done, looking back over the span of your life, where you're at right now, why did God choose you? Why did God forgive you? Why did God place his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross in your place? Did you deserve it? Jesus, the sinless son of God, was sent in your stead. Why did he accept you? I want to remind us this morning, as we walk to the table of salvation, we bring nothing but our sinfulness. As we sit down at the table before Almighty God, the only thing I bring is that what sent Jesus to the cross. You as well. So why? Why did God choose me? Why did God set my life apart? Why did he save you? Why did he forgive you of your sins? Church, in the same way Israel is called to remember that covenant relationship, so we need to remember this morning that God has chosen us because of nothing we've done, because of no one of who we are, anything we could ever do, it's because of God's grace and God's mercies alone. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, church, the covering for our sins. This morning, on this day that is to be set aside, God himself setting this day aside, we in America today, as much as the people in Israel, need to come to that time of remembering just what God has done for us. Church, it should have been me on the cross. It should have been you. But God, in his gracious love, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in his pl our place. Amen? This is to be a time of spiritual awakening, a time of repentance back into our lives. 
Now the third and the final point I want to hit this morning is this. This is where it's going to get exciting. You ready? The trumpets from a prophetic perspective. The trumpets from a prophetic perspective. As you're writing your notes down, I want you to look back at point number one. Do you remember what name number four was? The day of judgment. This was to be a day of remembrance, yes. This was to be a day of confession, yes. This was to be a day of recognition back in our own lives and what God's done, yes. But church, every one of those pointing to nine days later, understanding we're going to come to that time of repentance. Why? Because there is coming a day of judgment inside of our lives. A day when every person will stand before Almighty God to give an account of every portion of our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this, For we must all. Church, who does all include? It's very simple understanding if we just stop and listen, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in this body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There will be a day that every man, every woman, every child will stand before Almighty God. And he's saying, here's that trumpet call. Here's that shofar being blown. Why? So that we would stop and remember there is a day that's coming. Church, the reason we remember back to what God's done, there is a day or a reason why we're repenting of our sins. Why? Because there's a coming day when we'll stand before Almighty God. Well, church, what will that day look like? How will we stand? How will we appear before Almighty God? This is where I believe with all my heart it speaks of that foretold rapture of the church. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me, if you will. The rapture of the church. This is a very debated subject, believe it or not. More and more, as the end time comes, as time goes closer and nearer, it's funny how Satan begins to deceive and throw those questions up in the mind, even amongst the Southern Baptists today, where they're questioning this. But I want you to listen very clearly. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. I hear the pages turning, so I'm going to wait till you get there, because I want you to see what the Word of God says. It's very hard to misunderstand this. This is how good Satan is, though. 1 Thessalonians 4, I'm going to pick up verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, means he's coming, will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who have already passed on from this life. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. There's another shout, a trumpet blast, church. With a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Is there anything hard to understand in the midst of that? Church, can I tell you what he's saying? Jesus is coming. There's going to be a day when the heavens are going to part, the clouds are going to set aside, and Jesus himself is going to step out. And Jesus is going to say, come home. For all of us who have made Jesus Lord and Savior of our life, if we repented of our sins, he's going to look and say, you're mine, come home. It's done. It's time for a time of rest. After that soon day of judgment, I want to remind us this. There will be a time that we who have made Jesus Christ Lord, of our sa our Lord and Savior, if we repent of our sins, we will be judged in accountability. Look at Revelation 22, verse 12. Revelation 22, verse 12 says this, Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone, not to some, to everyone according to his works. Do you know what a reward is to me? It's not something that's given because everybody gets one, but it's something that's given as each life is evaluated, and you're given according to what you've done yourself. I don't get judged or looked at upon what somebody else did and how they responded. It's all looking at my life and my life alone. So he says each person will be rewarded according to the deeds done inside of his own body. In Revelation 19, it states that we're, as Christians, look at me now, we're to be clothed when we get to heaven according to our righteous acts, what we've done in this life. As Christians today, understand how we live here. Knowing I gave my heart to Christ as a young man, from the very day I gave my heart to Christ and I professed him as Lord and Savior, making myself a child of God at that moment, my life has been on the evaluation process, in accountability. Everything I've said, everything I will say, everything I've done, everything I will do is be held, being held in account. Why? So that I can be rewarded and clothed according to how I've lived. Let me back that up. This is the New American Standard Bible. I use their translation. I love the way it states this. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. 
He says, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride. Who is the bride? We are the church. Has made herself ready. And it was given to her, to us, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. Watch this. For the fine linen is the righteous acts, the obedient acts of the saints. What we wear in heaven is going to be according to what we've done here on this earth. So for those of us who are trying to walk through grace saying, I know what Jesus did on the cross. I know where I stand inside my salvation. I can now live however I want because my grace is good. God's grace is good. Church, we'll be clothed according to how we live on this earth. And by the way, that's not how salvation works. That's not how salvation works. That's not what he's called us to. You've got a false understanding of salvation. That's not what he's called us to. Today I've been set free from my sins to walk in obedience. To walk in the freedom that God's called me to. To know that that reward in my life will be good. That's why we hear those words, my good and faithful servant. Because we're walking in the power he gives us through his Holy Spirit. So we need to know as Christians today, we will be judged in accountability for how we have lived our life every day since the day of salvation in the name of Christ. But understand this as well. Now listen, this is for our friends, our family members, our co-workers, these people that are around us every day. For any person that has not repented of their sins and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they too will be judged. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, talking about every person, no person will be left out, standing before God. And books, plural, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Every deed by every man, woman, and child is written down. Everything was written down inside the books. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Church, it's a very real truth inside the word of God today. There is going to be a day of judgment. And if we have not professed Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, forever that person will be judged and condemned to a very real place called hell. We don't speak that in church very much anymore today. But that's why we're speaking of it on this occasion. Why do we celebrate this day? A day that God has set aside for that horn to be blown for a time of remembrance? Because listen to me, knowing I've made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, I know that I have people that live around me every day. Family members, people that have the same name as I, friends that I walk around every day, co-workers, people that we walk amongst in the stores. They're walking by us every day and we know they're lost. And we don't take the occasion, we don't take the privilege, the opportunities we have to share with them in the name of Jesus Christ. Why should that matter to us? Because one day they're going to be judged and forever they'll be cast into a very real place called hell. And you know whose blood that's going to be on? Whose hands are going to be on? Ours. We are the watchmen. We're the ones to be blowing the trumpet today. Our voices to be calling out because we know that Jesus is coming. I heard everyone in this room say amen when I said that. We know Jesus is coming, and we know he's coming soon. So how can we be busy doing anything but proclaiming the name of Christ? How can we be busy living for anybody but the name Jesus Christ? Knowing that's our privilege and that's our responsibility. That's the call that's been placed upon our lives. Matthew 28 verse 19 and 20. Go therefore. Not, hey, if you have time, go. If you're comfortable with it, go. If you can, go. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all. Church, that life has been placed upon us. That call has been placed upon us. It's a time for us to remember that Jesus is coming and those who have not made him Lord and Savior will forever be judged to a very real place called hell. So the question I want to ask this morning, by chances we're sitting in this room, is there somebody in this room that won't be ready? If today were the day, because the Bible tells us no man knows the day or the hour. We don't know the time that Jesus is going to step out and that trumpet's going to sound and he calls us home. Because in that very moment that he calls, I want you to understand it's over. Time's up. Game's done. There is no overtime. By chance, is there any of us sitting in this room today that we won't be ready because we've not made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior? Because today can be the day of salvation. Today can be that day that you make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. 
But maybe it's not you. Maybe it is a family member. Maybe it is a friend or a coworker. This is the opportunity we have that, that, as that trumpet's being sounded for us to recall, to remember, to call to attention, to waken up, that spiritual awakening for us to get out of our sleep, our slumber, from walking through life as we will, thinking it's about us. It's not. Church, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. The day we gave him our heart, we gave him our life, it's not about us anymore. So today we need to come to that time of remembrance. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have to put on the imperishable and this mortal will have to put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? You know where it is today, church? For those of us who have made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, death is is wrapped up in victory. We can stand in truth this morning. This is a day of celebration, a new beginning. As they blew that trumpet and said, today is the day of creation, let it be new in us. As we're calling back to that remembrance of who we truly belong to, for nothing we've done, but because of everything God's done on our behalf through his son, Jesus Christ. I am no longer my own. I've been bought at a price that I should no longer live for myself, but for him who died for me and rose again. Church, that's the truth that rises up in us today. Will you be ready?